Julia, how are you? I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, I was following some of your uh, postings on X. I have to be mindful to say X now because, you know, it's it's changed. And um, my daughter just graduated from college three weeks ago. And I saw that you were recently a commencement speaker at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. I do want to ask you about that experience. Um, the speaker for my daughter's commencement was the treasurer of the state of Massachusetts, Deb Goldberg. And, you know, everybody has expectations. You walk in, you're like, oh, you know, what, what is a state treasurer going to talk about? And, and she was fantastic. She was funny. She was engaging. It was her birthday. So we like <laughs> sang happy birthday to her, like, you know, the entire commencement of so and um, what was the experience like for you? It was, and was you know, it your it was, first time or? It was my first before? commencement speech. I was honored and thrilled. I met the chancellor of the university actually at a CNBC CEO summit. And she, she started asking me about my book and I was telling her about it. And she said, I'd love to have you come to the university to speak. And I said, sure. And she, sure. she read my book. She wrote me some very um, enthusiastic emails. And then when they invited me to speak, I honestly was shocked. I thought I would just come to a book <laughs> talk, um, but it's a huge university. It was yeah, such an honor. Huge. And it's such an amazing, diverse university, so many first-generation college grads. Love that. Um, and so I felt a huge amount of responsibility I and um, uh, to, to, to deliver a fun and interesting speech. And my speech ultimately was about how we are all leaders. I love it. And when you graduate college, you don't think of yourself as taking on a leadership role. You're, you, I mean, at least I myself, when I, I, I graduated college and was a young reporter at Fortune magazine, I thought of myself as a little worker bee who was going to do the research. Be told work. what to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, be told what to do, not have to think like a leader. But ultimately, what my speech was about was that now we all have to think like leaders, mm -hmm. um, whether you're straight out of college or you're part of a team or, yes, even if, you're, if you're running something. But ultimately, even everyone at the lowest levels needs to think of themselves as leaders. And part of that is yeah. because of technology and the fact that artificial intelligence is taking some of those entry level jobs and making the most mundane parts of them obsolete. Sure. So um, there's a, a great opportunity yeah, now that. Um, everyone can think like a leader, but I also think that's a pressure that we need to stop thinking of there being an opportunity to just do the rote work and do what someone told you because right. that's what AI is going to be for. Right. Um, um, but I think that the beauty of that is we can all unlock our own leadership styles and we can lead in different ways. And and um, and that I think is really what the, the opportunity is. And I think that looking back the way People used to think about leaders. They were people who were running things Correct. and there was a certain idea of how a leader behaved. And um, in my my research and my work and in my book, When Women Lead, I talk about how that's really not the case. Anyone right. can be a leader and also successful leaders come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I was um, in Mystic, Connecticut on vacation and there's a great bookstore downtown Mystic, Connecticut. It's called uh, Bank Square Books, I think. And I'm walking and along and I, I look on the shelf and I see this blue cover with the red lettering. And nice. I I had just, you know, I was about, I started this podcast in June of 21. And this was like end of 22, like holiday time. We had gone down for the holidays. You know, it's very quaint and mystic if you've ever been. And I see this book, When, when Women Lead. And I'm like, this is something that I know I need to read because here I am trying to, uh, be a platform for women leaders and women entrepreneurs as a, as clearly not one of them. And uh, you know, I wanted to, 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 to get that sort of perspective that you wrote and, and in your book, you really explore, right. The impact of female leadership on the corporate world, but let's back up a second, Julia, you know, what, what even inspired you to sit down and write this book, given that you're a senior media and technology correspondent with CNBC. I'm sure that keeps you pretty busy. How did all that kind of, how did that kind of come together? Yes, my day job keeps me very busy um, yes. as, a, as a media and tech reporter for CNBC, but it is also my day job that inspired me to write this book. Sure. And I, 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 after graduating college, um, I, I had six years, spent six years as a reporter at Fortune magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and I've now actually been at CNBC for 18 years. I think this is my 18 year anniversary this wow. week. Wow, congratulations. Um, so a very long time. And in that time, I've interviewed so many amazing leaders, leaders, mm. people who are running things, founders, CEOs, um, VC investors. And, um, and in the past decade or so, I started to notice more women in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and I, I noticed that these women were doing things differently. I run the CNBC Disruptor 50 list, which right. I created a dozen years ago. 
And I started seeing more female founders. And I was really struck, particularly by these female founders, that the odds were against them. The number yeah. that got stuck in my head was that 3% of all venture capital funding on average between 2011 and 2021 went to female founded companies. Crazy. So that 3% was a was a crazy number to me. 3% of all VC dollars. Crazy. Um, yeah. and, and, and at the same time, I was meeting these women who had defied those odds and they were really exceptional. Mm. Not only leading companies differently, um, their own styles, not the top-down hierarchical approach, um, but they're also solving different types of problems and approaching sure. problems solving differently. So I was really impressed by them. I was kind of obsessed by that 3% number. Um, and how it is crazy rather upset. It can make you rather obsessive when you think about it. Yeah. 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 And also, if you think about there's no other place in American business where there are such massive gender gaps. Um, one gender gap statistic that people cite often is that about 10% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 are women. And the number is kind of stuck around there. There's mm -hmm. this article about how it's kind of stuck around there. Um, but that, that's nothing like the 3% gap. And actually, notably, since I started working on my book, that 3% number has dropped to 1.8%. It, it, it's it, you, when you, whenever we, I, I follow the venture capital market very closely as you do as well. And whenever I see those numbers continue on a downward trend, despite the fact that people like you are trying to shed a bright light on this. Um, yes. It's, it's crazy. Right? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. so for me, what I wanted to do was just to tell the stories of women who had defied the odds mm. with the idea that they were incredibly inspiring to me. I would leave these interviews just vibrating with excitement about these amazing women I'd gotten to meet. And I wanted to share that, to share right. that energy and to share these surprising and sometimes shocking stories of success. And I wanted to share that. And then I also wanted to lay bare the data. Right. And all of the data indicates, and there are 40 pages of endnotes in my book. So my book looks longer than it actually is. But those endnotes are important. What? Those endnotes are important, right? The endnotes you know, are important. And I actually yeah. thought for my book in particular, they the were especially important. Right. Because I wanted to make sure that people didn't think I was just saying the female leaders were great. Yes, they're great. But there are plenty of ways to just say that. I wanted mm -hmm. to show it. Sure. With the 60 examples of women I quote in my book, and also with the hundreds of academic studies I researched, I cite mm -hmm. about 100 studies in the book. And all the research shows that the ways in which women tend to lead, and I say this again, this is all stuff that's socialized, it's all tend to, anyone can lead in these ways. The ways that women tend to lead um, are, are approaches that actually would be incredibly valuable for anyone to adopt. Mm. So whether it's a communal leadership style or trying to do big picture sol problem solving, um, a convergent versus divergent, I'm sorry, a divergent versus, versus a convergent, convergent yeah. approach. All of these things being highly adaptable, which women tend to be more highly adaptable than men. All of those things are incredibly effective leadership styles. And everyone, regardless of their gender, should be learning from these women. Sure. And I would say that the pandemic, and I wrote my book during the pandemic, right. mm -hmm. the pandemic really heightened this. Mm. And, and the pandemic shed a light on the fact that these leadership skills and strategies that women are more likely to have they are more essential now than ever. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do with the data is just show how crazy some of these gender gaps are and how irrational they are. <laughs> you know, I'm a business journalist. I love numbers. I love data. I think the best stories are when the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Right. right. I don't. I don't want to have an opinion in my reporting. Um, although I do think it's great if gender equity happens. You know, that's something that I will sure. have. Yeah, say you're not going to. You know, you're not going to not be in favor of that. Right? Yeah, I'm in favor yeah. of that. But yeah. other than that, I want the numbers to speak for themselves. And what the data shows is that more diverse teams are more successful. Mm. If you have gender equity or even gender representation in the C-suite, in um, on boards companies outperform. There's amazing research showing that startups with female founders, even though they raise less money and get smaller checks on average, they tend to have more profitable outcomes and to go public. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. How much more often, and I, I've studied the same data that you have, how when when women lead, not to not to hit that on the nose too much, but they're, the organizations tend to be more profitable right? Tend to have yes. better outcomes. And it's I do think what's hard thing. about my business in the media world um, is that when someone is rare in a role, they draw heightened attention or scrutiny. And I write about this in the book. This is token theory. And this is true of anyone, regardless mm -hmm. of what their background is. If you are rare in a role, people are going to pay more attention to you. Of course. And if you like fail, yeah. right? Yeah. If you fail, like an Elizabeth Holmes type spectacular failure, mm -hmm. people are going to really pay a lot of attention to that. Sure. And I think that those narratives and the obsession with those rare failures unfairly cast a negative light on women mm. who are doing great. Mm. 
I um I'll tell you a quick anecdote. So the company I was most recently at uh, had a female CEO, and we were out looking to raise money. So we were at uh, J.P. Morgan attending attending meetings, and we walked into the room, and our CFO is present, who is a male, and she's present, who is a female. And want to guess how many of the folks we met with thought that the CFO was the CEO and she was maybe the CFO or some not, but certainly not the CEO, right? I mean, it was just to, to your point, just a very uh, uh, token, right? Like, oh, yeah. so oh, you're the CEO. Oh, oh I'm, I'm not used oh. to seeing a female oh, CEO. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I think that's the thing is that I don't assume malice at all. I think right. that a lot of these things are just socialized. People have yeah. this natural instinct towards pattern matching. Maybe they've never seen a female CEO before. So their <laughs> assumption was that this guy who seems to be the one who's talking the most or the, right. the, the loudest voice, of course he must be the CEO, right? That, that yeah. fits into my sense. pattern. Yeah. Of, right. Yeah. So I think it's really important for, for everyone to see these stats. And I've actually been speaking to um, universities and business schools. I'm really excited to get the, this book into the hands of young people yes. because I think it's really valuable for men. Yes. I think for men to see this data, the yes. men can say, hey, I want to lead like that. I can be successful without having to fit myself into a box. Mm. And they also could say, oh, my God, I didn't realize I was doing that. I need mm. to know that that's something I'm a, a trap I might fall into um, so I don't fall into it. I recently had uh, a guest on the show, a woman named Leanne Mayer, and she wrote a book called Closing the Gap. Similar name, but not but not exactly what the project that you worked on, the Closing the Gap project that you worked on. And specifically, she was trying to shine a light on how diversity, equity, inclusion programs are great, right? Obviously, on the surface, um, in her particular um, uh, experience as a Black woman felt that some DEI programs are not well suited to advance, in particular, you know, black women. Um, and that's kind of the main thesis of her closing the gap book. But Julia, have you seen effective environments where inclusion and, and diversity programs have, have taken shape and have been effective? Um, I found it really interesting that she was kind of focusing even further on, you know, yeah. On, on and and she's absolutely right. There's a lot of research that shows that groups like like uh, uh, affinity groups, if you will, sure. um, on the corporate level that are focused on gender oftentimes ex end up excluding black women. Hmm. And there is a phenomenon where for years the research showed that that gender focused equity groups ended up benefiting white women, but not women of color Interesting. and end up actually having a negative impact on women of color um, hmm. if you look at it across the board. And so the research is pretty powerful. And that's one reason why there's a big focus now on intersectionality. And I write about this a little bit in my book, but this idea that people have multiple marginalized identities and the more marginalized identities one person has, the more of a risk there is that they be excluded mm. from the conversation. And so I think that's why affinity groups have to be really thoughtful sure. in how they're done. Um, and also there needs to be an acknowledgement of this intersectionality. You can't talk just about gender. You can't talk just about race. You have to talk about the intersectionality of all of these different factors. Age is another one. Disability is another one. You really have to bring them all into the conversation. Um, one thing that I think is interesting about what it takes for these you know, approaches to be effective for companies is I think that one thing that's really useful is just data and transparency. Again, I yeah. feel like I've mentioned data, <laughs> data okay. many times, <laughs> but you can't understand what's going on at your company unless you measure it. Mm. Um, and so I think having a real sense of, what percentage of your employees are female? What percentage of your engineering employees are female? What right. percent are people of color? Yeah, and then breaking yeah. it down by category. So you really have a wide picture. The other thing that I think is really effective is a very thoughtful approach, a very thoughtful data-driven approach. That's going to be my buzzword. A uh, data-driven <laughs> approach to not just hiring, but also promotion. Mm. At CNBC, I um, did a, a, a story or a, a couple of stories on, um, and this is for my Closing the Gap initiative at CNBC, about how PayPal and Salesforce, run at the time by Mark Benioff at Salesforce right. and Dan Shulman at he PayPal, running both. Yep. Yeah, yep. who run, running the yep. separate companies. Um, and I say, I, I'm pointing this out because these are two white men who, who took big steps to close promotion gaps. Mm. Um, they both discovered that they didn't have pay gaps at the same level. What they had was promotion gaps and they were actually inadvertently, their companies were promoting male employees much faster than hmm. female employees. And what that resulted in is over time, the male employees 
end up having much bigger jobs, access to the Swiss sure, school, of course. much higher salaries. But it wasn't because they weren't paying people the same thing at the same level. It was because right. of the faster pays promotions. Only. Yeah, pays only you one don't factor. Have a, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say pay, pay is just one factor, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. just understanding what's going on, measuring it, tracking it, creating systems. So the pay and the promotion and the hiring can be really data driven and not because someone's like, oh, I'm so sick of this guy banging on my door. I'll, I'll talk to him about when it's time to, to re review him for promotion. It takes the subjectivity out of it. Sure. And I think those are the systems that are most um, effective over the long run. I saw at certain companies that I was at, like in the mid 2000s, Julia, really starting to push the affinity groups, right? So we have an affinity group for people who identify as, as BIPOC or, you know, sexual orientation affinity groups or veterans or anything else, right? But again, I, I saw that as kind of like a lot of checking the box of like, hey, we, yes, we have an affinity group, right? But to your point, like, what are, what are you really doing with those affinity groups aside from maybe posting on social media and making people feel good about the fact that you have these affinity groups and once a year or once a, a quarter having some sort of an event, what data are you collecting and reacting to, right? Um, through maybe not just through these affinity groups, but through any of your inclusion and, and diversity efforts as an organization, right? Yeah, but there has been a lot of research and I talk about this a little bit in the book, some studies about what they call micro environments. Hmm. Um, and there's been some really interesting research about why affinity groups are valuable. And the hmm. idea is that if you're in a, a group that's a minority, so if you're at a big tech organization and you're a woman or a person of color and the, the tech organization, tech companies, largely white men, if you have a, an identity that's of the minority group, that it's really important for you to be around other people like yourself. Right. And part of that is to counter- that look like you, yeah. yeah. That look like you, to counter mm -hmm. negative stereotypes. There's mm -hmm. an amazing study that I love so much in the book that talks about the, the, the reality that negative stereotypes can have a negative impact on performance. Mm -hmm. And there, I love these social scientists who do these fascinating studies, but this particular one, they gave men and women a math test um, and, uh, and then sort of just, saw how they scored and they sc scored roughly the same. Mm -hmm. They um, brought women together and they said, you know, there's a stereotype that women are really bad at math. Women are mm -hmm. bad at math. We're going to give you engineers a math test um, and we're going to see how you do. After being told that negative stereotype, which is a real stereotype that women have to, to fight, I'm sure. their scores went down. Being reminded hmm. of the negative stereotype had a had a specific impact on their psychological story. impact. Yeah, yeah, totally. But when they brought the women together, said, "Hey, all you female engineers, meet each other, get to know each other. Look, there are lots of you who are doing this." Then they told them the negative stereotype. That stereotype had no impact. <laughs> so what they basically found is the presence of this, or the the if impact of this micro environment of having other people like you, actually counteracted the negative impact of a stereotype. Mm. Hmm. And I think that's so valuable. We need to have um, things like mentoring and sponsorship or things really? are between different groups. But there is a specific benefit if you are in a group that's in the minority to have hmm. other people like you to connect with. I, I want to ask you another question, Julia. Back to the the you had mentioned, you know, the pay was equal, but the the promotional paths were were unequal, right? And men were being promoted faster. Um, and I think you've talked a little bit about this in terms of like being uh, confident, right, to go in and ask for that promotion, right? Um, I, I Certainly a lot of the, the women that I've managed throughout my career always felt not confident to come forward and, and, and say, I think I'm ready for a promotion. In fact, I had someone the other day I was texting with who was trying to get up the, the nerve to so go in and say to their boss, I think it's time that I should be promoted. Um, what insight do you have there, Julia, around around women who just don't feel like they can go in and, and make a case for promotion and at worst will put themselves at risk if they go and do that? I mean, what's interesting is that if you were in a company where they had a, a very clear system about when you're eligible for promotion and they only sure. consider people every six months and they're going to consider everyone whether they're asking for a raise or not then that eliminates that, right? right? Then people get promoted and pay raises based on their performance because the manager is like, okay, what has this person done? I'm reviewing them because it's time for me to review them, not because they're banging on my door. That would mm. address that. Um, there's some really interesting research about women and confidence uh, and things like imposter syndrome. We hear a lot right. about imposter syndrome. Everyone right. feels imposter syndrome. Women tend to feel it more than men. Well, yep. um, but the, the research I love about confidence, and I say this because I'm over 40 years old, <laughs> is that women's confidence increases 
And it, when women enter the workforce, their confidence starts off relatively low. When men mm. enter the workforce, their confidence starts off relatively high. Over time, women's confidence increases and men's confidence decreases. And it crosses around age 40. So women actually have greater confidence than men um, starting around age 40. And then it kind of plateaus off. Hmm. But what the social scientists think about this is that women gain confidence with age and experience. And so the more more time you've been working, the more you're like, okay, I really know that I can I can ask for this or I can do this or I can take the leap and start a company. Men are more likely to start companies straight out of college or, sure. or drop yeah. out of college um, because they have that sort of built in confidence. These are things that are not biological, right? That part is socialized. And part of it is a lack of access to experience of here's what's actually happening. If you don't have as many role models or as many examples, sure. female success you stories, then you're not going to have the same reason to have the confidence um, because you're going to say, I don't know, there are other examples of people like me who have succeeded. So it's all, all of it is socialized. It's a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, but I think the more we could tell these stories and really break down Great. the data, the more it addresses that. I've had so many women on this show who have said to me, when I told my family that I wanted to be an entrepreneur or I wanted to start my own business, um, how often, you know, they felt that just purely the fact that, wait a minute, this isn't what girls do, right? Like you you need to go get a job first and, and get some experience or do this or do that, or there's something else that will shape, right, you before you can do this. Um, and, and, the, and the bravery of the ones that have said, no, I'm actually ready to do this now. I am going to do this now. Right. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna wait and, and, and work for 10 years and then decide, um, conversely, I, I've met women who have done the 10, 12, 15 year, very successful corporate career, and then just leave that behind because they're so passionate about some, you know, entrepreneurial activity that they want to get in that they, they kind of just say, I'm doing this now. Right. Um, yeah. And, and your point about the passion is that women yeah. are more likely to have purpose driven companies. 100%. And that passion yep. is it's not just about creating a product to make money and yield returns to your investors and make money. It's passion because you want to have some additional social or environmental mm -hmm. impact beyond just making money. Right. And so um, it, that is something that women are more likely to do. And there's also a lot of research showing that purpose driven companies are more valuable, outperform because yeah. it's easier to hire employees. Absolutely. Maybe it's easier to market your product. Maybe it's easier. It. Yep to retain talent. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout your research that you did for the book, Julia, and then of course, the numerous uh, conversations, interviews that you've done through your career at CNBC, and I'm sure it's really hard for you to just pick one or two, but where are the most sort of impactful or um, sort of amazing conversations that you have had. And, and, you know, you don't have to name names if you don't want to, but thematically, I guess, Julia, where were the, where, what were the themes that you heard that really kind of impressed you and maybe even started to shape some of what you talked about in the book? Well, I guess I'll, I'll pick out a couple from the book because I really have done so with thousands of interviews and it's so hard to pick. Yeah, um, sure. But a couple of, uh, of interviews in the book that really just stick with me and are things that I think about every single day. Hmm. One is this CEO named Toyin Ajayi. She's the CEO of um, a, a health care company called City Block Health. Oh, sure. And she's based in Brooklyn. I actually just got to interview her for CNBC. Sure. Yeah, they're a great was, company. Yeah, they're they're awesome. But she was telling me her origin story, which mm. included going from Stanford and working in San Francisco to and and going to you know studying medicine in London to working in Sierra Leone, mm. where she was trying to fix a, uh, a a children's hospital, a pediatric hospital. And she talked about how uh, that there was she was trying to get the the medical medicine to be better. She was trying to get the doctors to stay overnight, and she discovered there was no running water. And fixing the water was not part of her job description. She was trying to sure. improve the medical care, but she had to fix the water if she was going public to health. It's a care. public health problem. Yeah. 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 And so, but she, but she would literally would have doctors going in and, you know, nurses would be carrying water in and out of the hospital. And so she talked about how that really shaped her approach of thinking, what is the water supply? Mm. What is the water supply that needs to be fixed? What are the mm. broken pipes that I need to address before I could fix the bigger picture uh, problem? And then she went to, um, uh, she was at uh, actually in Boston, she's at Mass General, mm. working there as a resident. And she saw there was also a water supply problem or a sort of figurative <laughs> water supply problem, an infrastructure problem where patients weren't um, weren't adhering to their 
their doctor's orders. They weren't taking their medicine. They often had patients who were homeless and they would be discharged out into the street. And how so could they, that patient take care of him? How, or could they be how will they be successful? Right. Yeah. Although those social determinants of, of health yeah. just overwhelming their, their overwhelming. Yeah. And so she said, yeah. what, what, what is the water supply here that needs to be fixed? So she had created a company that would take that big picture approach um, I, and I love the, the, health theme, and provide the metaphor of the water supply. Challenge. Yeah, the metaphor yeah, of this yeah. water supply. Yeah, so I love it. City Black Health, they have social workers who work for them. They help get mm -hmm. people housing, access to food, make sure that they have people who are like social workers, not doctors, make sure they're taking their medicines. Their goal is to keep people out of the hospital. Sure. Sure. And it was just this different approach. And so sometimes when I'm problem solving, um, whether it's with my kids or at work, I'm like, what is the what is the underlying issue here? Right. What do I need to address before I can get to the things that seem like the service issues? And I think that that's, you know, she was a very empathetic leader. Um, and it was her empathy for her patients that led her to solve the problem. But she was really a divergent thinker as well, you know, looking to understand the entirety of a problem rather than converging on a specific solution. And that's a very um, traditionally female leadership trait. So I think about her a lot. I mean, her story is just wild. When she tells you her experiences, she went and met the, like the local medicine doctor who was handing out herbs to to people Unreal. in Sierra Leone who had their trust in a way that doctors didn't. She just did a phenomenal, has had a phenomenal um, story and career. And then another one I think of a lot because in, in so many ways, uh, she sort of exemplifies a lot of the adaptability that had to happen in this, the mm. pandemic. And I think now has to happen all the time is Karen Seidman Becker, who's okay. the CEO of a company called Clear. So if you've gone through an airport, oh, you may be an airport. You, airport if you're, sure. Yeah. So Clear, you, you, they do biometrics to get through airports. They do all sorts of other security things. They actually now have a deal with LinkedIn. So you can do biometric identification. Yes, I actually have a little check mark through there. <laughs> exactly. So she is an amazing story of adaptability. And I think that these days, it's such a volatile time in business, in the world. We all need to be adaptable all the time, sure. all the time. Sure. And she told me the story of how she was on a train from New York to Washington, D.C. on February 26th, which was weeks before 2020, weeks before the big lockdown in March 2020. Just, yeah, it just happened. And yeah, just everyone happen. still thought it would be everything would be yeah. fine. Two weeks and we'll be back and we'll be back to normal. Two weeks. But there yeah. still wasn't any lockdown orders. It was like, oh, it's just in, it's in Seattle. It's in a couple yeah. cities, um, maybe in New York. She um, had a phone call with someone about the data, what was going on with travel. And she within uh, within a, you know an hour of reviewing this data with her team decided to cancel all of their spending on advertising for the entire year. It was like $24 mm. million. Dollars. Mm. And people were like, this is nuts. Why would you cancel it for your whole year? This doesn't make any sense. Um, why not just cancel it for like a month maybe? Sure. And she said, no, I'm, I'm looking at the data. I'm not going to get tied up in, in, in my personal connection and attachment to the plans we made and the creative decisions we made and the ads we, we were planning on running. I'm responding to the data and I need mm. to be unemotional and, and decisive and data driven and use the data to see around corners. People told her she was nuts. And of course she turned out to be right. Right on um, board. Yeah. Right on board. And the fact that she was decisive and thinking for the long term meant that when things did come back, she was able to rehire a ton of people and actually expand and not only pivot to focus on healthcare and things like biometrics for identity, but just to make sure that this company didn't go under, which was obviously right. a risk if she had done things more piecemeal. So right. to me, think her adaptability. Um, and just like being willing to take a fresh look at the situation when the situation changes is something that's really hard. Um, but I think we all need to try to do more of and guided by the data to your point as well, right? Like you just said, seeing around corners, such an important aspect, right? But that adaptability, amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about who stands behind you, Julia. You know, we, we had, uh, uh, Rita Colwell on the show, who was the first female director of the National Science Foundation. She wrote a book called The Lab of One's Own, uh, where she talked about the tremendous sexism she witnessed in the 50s and the 60s um, as a female scientist, right? Just literally being told, you will never get tenure. You will never have access to this lab, right? If you've ever watched the Lessons in Chemistry show on Apple yeah. TV, it has it's that similar, you know, thread yeah. run through it, right? Of how a woman, a woman cannot be a chemist. But uh, Dr. Cowell talked a lot about her posse, which I loved because this is a woman in her 80s and she's telling me about her posse and who who stands behind her. I'm curious as to, to who, who, your, who your biggest community uh, is, who your biggest supporters are, Julie. Well, my mom, for one. <laughs> and uh. I write about my mom a little bit in the introduction to the book because 
my parents, my mom and my dad, you know, raised me to think I could do anything. And my mom really wanted to make me believe that the world would have was going to change and be different from the world she grew up in. Uh -huh. When she was growing up, she had the choice of teacher or nurse. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> and I would be able to choose anything. And of course, when I entered the working world, I was like, oh, there aren't a lot of female CEOs. Like, that's not really an option. Right. Um, but I'm grateful that she gave me the optimism and hope that I really, I really could do anything. Yeah. Do anything. Cool. And she's also now, you know, my inspiration in so many ways. Um, and, and very helpful uh, in, in she and my father are very helpful in grandparenting um, my husband and my kids. Um, my husband is, is, a, is a great resource because he sees the world so differently than me. Mm. And it's just amazing to talk to him about things and I'll tell him stories and I'll be like, what? Some, <laughs> someone said that to you? What? Are people allowed to say that? And so it's just, I'm very grateful to be able to have those really honest conversations with him about how different our experience is going through the world. Sure. Um, and then I have an amazing group of female friends um, who do all sorts of different things? Moms who are who are who are focused on staying home with their children, um, who are who are great allies in parenting and, and in life, and then women who are working in various different industries. And um, someone once explained to me that the idea of traditional mentorship is dead, oh. and this idea that you're going to have someone who who advises you and and tells you what types of opportunities you should be reaching for and gives you advice. Oh, like what not to do, what and what to do and what not what to do. What to do, what to do, not to do, yeah. who is simply someone who is more senior than you in your organization. Right. That's not how it works anymore. Mm. And actually, I was lucky to have that mentor. I had a mentor at Fortune Magazine who pushed me and advised me and yeah. believed in me. And that was a life-changing experience. Mm. But now I really think of mentorship as a, a circle of people. They talk about your personal board of directors and I have friends who are in venture capital, who are running companies in totally different industries than journalism. And it's just amazing how how valuable these friendships are, not only to support me when I'm tired or frustrated <laughs> or feel like I'm hitting a wall. Just, yeah, just need someone to, to vent hear, to. Yep. Yeah, but yeah. also to hear about their experiences. Um, I have a group of, I live here in Los Angeles, and I have a group of friends who we go on hikes together on Sunday or Saturday awesome. mornings. We'll go really early before our kids are up. <laughs> and it's just, I always feel, uh, leave feeling energized um, and excited to hear about their experiences and their work opportunities. And also I asked for their advice on how to navigate things myself. And it was, and it was really the support of those women that enabled me to write this book. I'm going to ask you to, to uh, pat yourself a little bit on the back right now, Julia. Um, I, I have to imagine the women who are part of that community with you feel just as uplifted and supported from you as you feel from them. I hope so. But I also think it is such a, such a two-way street. You know, right. like I think um, I, I went on a hike with a, a girlfriend uh, the other day who was thinking of starting a company and also considering some some job options. And it was so exciting to think decisions. you might get to do these things. Sure. Um, and so it's it's really it's really a gift. And frankly, the opportunity to interview the over 100 women I interviewed for my book was such a gift to meet these amazing women. And so it's I was just thrilled by the opportunity to talk to them and then share their stories. Did you feel the the need to, I mean, obviously because of your platform, I know that helps you to maybe potentially open doors. One of the questions that we do field from time to time is I want to talk to this person, but I'm scared to reach out to them. I don't want to send that cold email. Um, I, I'm sure your platform did open some doors, but out of the hundreds of people you talked to, were there ones that you just sent, you had to send that cold email and just fight through that fear? Yes, I sent a bunch of cold emails. Um, I also sent uh, messages, a lot of messages through LinkedIn. Actually, yep. um, I would I would DM people on Twitter. I would DM people on Instagram, and I often felt like you know I'm just gonna I'm just gonna really pull out all the stops. And if Go I message it. someone in five different ways and they don't want me to connect with them, then fine. But like at sure. least they know that I'm trying. I'm gonna, try. I'm gonna give it a hot. We're gonna yeah. give it the full try, the full court yeah. press, as they say, right? Yeah. That's awesome. And not everyone said yes, but um, right, sure. I, I did really try. And I also explained to them what I was trying to do with the book. And almost everyone, almost everyone said yes. I would also go on LinkedIn and see who was connected with this person I wanted sure. to interview. And could, then I would. Yeah, you could get a second degree uh, uh, of, of um, uh, what do they call that? Second degree of separation sort of uh, connection, right? Yeah. And yeah, then the other thing is because um, many of the women in my book were our entrepreneurs or CEOs, I would go to people who had worked with them. Um, mm. And first to figure out who to interview, right? I, I didn't just pull the people out of the newspaper. I was thinking I, 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 I was thinking I should go to the investors and to the advisors of some of the most innovative women in, in the in the business world and say, who do you think is most interesting? Who do you think has 
overcome the most or has the most inspiring story. So a lot of it was through referral because I was asking people who I trusted to give me their insight. Right, right. That's wonderful. Julia, before we let you go, um, as folks interact and engage with your book, um, your insights on women in leadership roles, what's maybe that one thing you're really hoping that they'll they'll pull from it and gain from that? I think that um, everyone is a leader, and I hope that everyone reads this book with an eye to connections between themselves and the women who have succeeded, who I write hmm. about in the book. And and I actually have in my in the paperback version of my book, there is a workbook in the end. Ooh. So if you buy the paperback, excuse me, if you buy the paperback, there is a workbook at the very end of the book. And in that workbook, you'll find some questions that are great to refer to while you're reading. Mm-hmm. And it's really about um, relating to these amazing women who are so successful, but understanding how we all have some of their traits within us. And then also really creating your own vision for how you want to succeed. Mm -hmm. and how you want to lead. Um, And one thing that was so universally true about the women I wrote about is that they were all authentic to themselves. And I think the word authenticity is overused. So I I, I hesitate to use it, but they all led in ways that were really about who they were. They weren't trying to pretend to be someone they weren't. And I think that's what really made them, enabled them to become successful. So I hope when people read the book, they make connections to their own personal skills and strategies And also find ways where they could stretch and grow. And that's what the workbook is really designed to do is to help people chart their own path to success and figure out how to identify what they're really good at and what they and what they really need to focus on um, to to learn and and to change and to grow. And I talk a little bit about the growth mindset in the book. um, And there's a I know there's a lot of stuff on growth mindset, but to enable you to identify the areas where you should have confidence and then the areas where you need to do work, that combination is really what a growth mindset is about. I love it. And I always always love a good workbook. So I'm, I'm excited to, to go and check out the paperback copy. The book is When Women Lead. Julia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today, telling us about the book, telling us about your story, all of your experiences. We'll see you on CNBC. And again, can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you for having me.